welcome to Not Just Books, the library's monthly show about what is happening in Williamson County and at the library. I'm Dolores Greenwald. I'm the director of the Williamson County Public Library. And today, we're going to be talking about Rick Warwick's new book, Barnes of Williamson County. Rick is the Williamson County historian, and he partnered with Kenita Skelly Hankins to put together a very beautiful book about Barnes and its relationship to the history of Williamson County. So please join us and we will be right back. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining us today. I have two very special guests with me, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Rick, you go first. Well, I am Rick Warwick, and I'm kind of known as the town gossip. Uh, my, my trade is uh, uh, the collection of history, and uh, I have been able to partner up with a lady that knows a whole lot more than I do. <laughs> Well, that's not true. <laughs> I'm Kanita Hankins, Kanita Skelly Hankins, if I put in my Williamson County uh, name, because the Skellies have been here for quite a long time. And I, was, I am retired now from the MTSU Center for Historic Preservation. And it has been my privilege to work with Rick on a couple of projects now, the most recent being the Barnes of Williamson County. Well, thank you both for joining us today. Um, you have also published another book previous to this on Barnes, correct? The Barnes of Tennessee. Yeah. I was privileged to co-author with Michael Gavin. We both were at the Center for Historic Preservation at MTSU. And that particular book was published by the Tennessee Electrical Cooperative oh. about 10 years ago, and okay. we included Barnes, obviously, from all across the state of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I had not realized that Barnes is such an interesting topic. And before we started taping, you were talking about another collaboration, so I would love to, to see that happen because this book is, is wonderful. Really enjoyed it. Um, Williamson County, of course, has a large farming past. How are farms and history connected? In Williamson County, they are hard to separate because Williamson County was one of the most productive agricultural counties in the state of Tennessee in terms of livestock, crops, and the culture of farming. Also, we know that some of the barns uh, are carried through from their culture where they came from. Pennsylvania's had a certain way of building barns. Virginia had a certain way. And, of course, they carried that, that uh, skill or technique of mm -hmm. building to this area. Well, there's various type of barns, and I, didn't, I hadn't really thought about that as I have gone through Tennessee and Alabama and looked at at barns and all different shapes and conditions. Um, what is the weakest barn, barn structure, do you think? Which lasts the least amount of time? Uh, probably just one that is what we call balloon framing. And it's just, uh, just a frame mm -hmm. covered by a, a siding or cladding. And uh, unless it's well built, it won't last as long as, say, the log barns mm -hmm. or some of the mortise and tenon uh, structures. Well, one of the types of barns mentioned in the book is bank and raised uh, frame barns. So you want to address what those are specifically and tell viewers a little bit about it? Well, the bank barns are a German origin barn. And as Rick mentioned, the people who settled in Tennessee brought their understanding of building and their need for barns 
what they were going to use them for mm -hmm. with them. So the raised barn is, and bank barns are ones that are built into the hillside. And that way the wagons could go up on the hillside and, get, and unload into the loft. And then the animals were down below. Mm -hmm. So you had two separate entrances. It also served the purpose of keeping the barns at a more reasonable temperature mm -hmm. in the summer and in the winter. And what time period were these the most popular? The bank barns? Mm -hmm. In Tennessee and here in Williamson County, they were built throughout the 19th century after probably about the 18 30s or so. You may find some a little bit earlier, but that's when some of the German settlers came into this area. There are a lot more of those in Franklin County around Winchester and also uh, in there's some settlements in Dixon County too of Germans and in the Lawrence County area where the German homesteaders, uh, German Catholic homesteaders were. So not so many here in Williamson County because we didn't have that tradition of German settlement quite as much. Rick, are there ex very many examples of these type of barns still? Well, there are. We, we, we put them in the book. Or the One of my favorites is near me. It's on the Boyd place. William I. Boyd came here in about 1803 and his barn stood until maybe... 30 years ago, no, 40 years ago, I guess. And it is beautifully constructed inside. Now his farm is, is sitting on a rise overlooking the West Harpeth River. And uh, it's it's a lot of rock and cedar. And apparently he he was able to dig out the side of the hill and build this, it was a, it was a wonderful barn. And it was a shame the owners did not keep it up and mm -hmm. the roof eventually fell in. And, but it was all uh, beautiful uh, timber um, and setting on this uh, in the side of the hill, and the mangers were in the in in the lower area, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a, 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 a opening in the center of the barn, and the hay could just be uh, pushed into that slot, and it would fall into the mangers. That is my one of my favorites, and I did have a, a good photograph of it. But there's others across the county. I think. Uh, um, Ford seat over mm -hmm. on the old Crockett place on uh, Wilson Pike is another good example. Um, another type of barn mentioned, and the and you mentioned the pictures in the book. They're wonderful. Fam, uh, some of the families of uh, of uh, own the uh, the barns mentioned. It's very. Uh, I love uh, individual pictures from different periods, people's outfits and the way they, their hairstyles and all that. I think that's wonderful. You can also learn a lot about history with that as well. Foundation barn. What is a foundation barn? Okay, a foundation barn is obviously one that isn't just built on the ground, but does have a bit of a, a foundation. And sometimes it goes up and it raises then a, a part of the barn, and it serves as kind of a bank barn, mm -hmm. but it's not built into a hillside. But the uh, the wagons can go up and over, or else it's just built up on a foundation so that the wagon goes behind and unloads in the loft again. And then the, the lower part has doors and, and bays where the wagons can go through or the livestock can go through. Well, I guess the different styles of barns that we're talking about, especially in Tennessee with the hills and, you know, flat areas, this, uh, this is a really good indication of how agriculture adapted to its environment. That's right, That's right. because, uh, for example, here, in Williamson County, we have many tobacco barns. Those were yeah, one we're of the talk about those. primary ones. Yeah, but in West Tennessee, you don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you had cotton fields and you don't really have barns for cotton. 
So different types of barns across the state. Now, yes. uh, construction improved as the population expanded here, and wood frame barns became a little more industrial, I guess you could say. But you want to talk about wood frame barns? Wood frame barns uh, were the um, extension of log barns, which of course came first. And then uh, because they were expedient and they needed shelter immediately. The wood frame barns, as the county became more populous and more prosperous, they could take time to build better barns. And that's when you find some of the most incredible barns that we have in this county is from that period from about uh, 1840 on up through the 1870s where they took virgin timbers and made sills that were 60 feet or more long, mm -hmm. one piece of, of wood uh, where they mortised and tenoned so that they fitted these these joists and roofs and and the uh, framing together in a way that it just did not move and has not moved that much over these years. They were built to last. I think the best example of that is the Sparkman barn out at, at Boston. It was probably the largest that we found and the best built. And it had that same... Uh, large base logs that were like 14 inches square and all the the members that are making the construction of the barn is just wonderful. Originally probably uh, the early barns were covered in wood shakes and that gave way to t metal bar metal covered roofs that you see mostly today that have survived. Is this the first time pre-cut lumber was used? Uh, barns? Pre-cut lumber actually didn't appear until post-Civil War. Uh, that was when really we began to have more sawmills in the county. Mm -hmm. And so you had pre-cut lumber and, that's, and also nails, pre-cut nails. Mm -hmm. So that made a great change from what was built uh, say in the first uh, 50, 60 years of the 19th century and then the latter part of the 19th century as things became more mechanized. And that's when your balloon framing came mm -hmm. into being with the pre-cut mm -hmm. lumber and your nails and your hardware that was just readily available then. And also uh, pole barns is talked about in the book. Uh, they were designed to allow maximum access to ground floor above, which is a lot, which is a lot. So yeah. but talk to us a little bit about that. E easier to build. And they have been built all the time throughout the 19th and into the 20th century because they are so easy to put up. You just set poles on the ground and then you put uh, beams across them. You don't worry about flooring. You just use dirt or gravel flooring. And um, then you have a loft and you have easy access to drive through. Or if you have gates, then you can put your livestock in. So very easy, very practical, much less expensive to do pole barns. There's still pole barns here? Oh, oh, sure. Yeah, and still being built, too. Still being built. Well, most of the tobacco mm -hmm. barns and the hay barns were were pole. It's quick construction, and uh, it, it was, could be done quickly, and, and it was inexpensive. Now, uh, the gentry farm, which is probably one of the most popular farms in this area, has a, is a central aisle barn, is that correct? Well, there's several barns out there, but yeah. yes, most, mm -hmm. most barns have the central aisle and with the wings uh, to the side. And it has what's called in the book a hay bonnet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the central aisle barns. Right. That's the most popular barn that was ever built, style of barn, simply because it's multi-use. 
It can be used on smaller farms, on your large farms. Uh, you can use it for livestock, crops, uh, workspace. Uh, and, and generally, it has an aisle down the middle, which is why we call it a central aisle. And then it has stalls uh, to this each side. And then sometimes they add additional sheds for equipment. And then your hay bonnet or your, uh, sometimes they call it the, the hay loft entry uh, or a hanging gable but it just serves the purpose of leaving the loft open because you have to have ventilation in lofts mm -hmm. because of the hay storage. And it just made it easier to get, when they were doing uh, square bales especially, to load them up and into the loft for stacking and storage so then they could get them out. But it covered it from the elements. Though you do have a few uh, lofts that have doors that can be closed underneath the hay bonnet. And also mentioned are what's called hay barns. Mm -hmm. Hay topped the list in acreage with soybeans second. Now, I can guess why that was the case, but you want to, Rick, you want to tell me? Well, <clears throat> hay was needed, of course, on the farm to feed the livestock. And uh, that was something that, you know, in this area, we can get two to three cuttings a year. And uh, you needed a large supply of it. So the loft usually was the best pl storage place for that. Then later we have the roll uh, barn. You know, the, they roll the hay now. And sometimes that is kept in, in on, the, uh, on the sheds where you can pull the tractor in. And you can stack a lot of of rolls in that if you want to keep it dry. Of course, they now use a plastic over it to keep the water out, but um, that was necessary. And every farm, if you had livestock, you had to have a store, a place to store your hay. And uh, one identifying uh, feature is a, is Gothic roofs for hay barns. Um. Kind of a stylized Gothic roof. Stylized Gothic. Yeah, not exactly what you see on, on domestic architecture. No, or, or, I mean, the pictures or, looked yeah, a little different. Right. But. Yeah, yeah, but still, you've got this, this point, which is Gothic. Any good examples? I would bet there are today still of hay barns. Not that I know that's standing now. We had really? some old pictures of... Aren't you thinking about maybe uh, the Pitner barn? That was probably the most right. exotic uh, because it was shipped mm -hmm. in here from Knoxville. Ah. It, it all, everything was cut there and then put on the railroad uh -huh. uh, and, and cars and came to Franklin and then down to West Harpeth and unloaded and, and put on Mr. Robert Pitner's farm. Uh, and that was a very, it was the only one I know of in the county mm -hmm. that had that really steep roof with mm -hmm. a, it's almost like an arch at the top. Uh, and we talked a little bit about tobacco barns. Tobacco, and Rick and I have talked about this before in one of his previous books about how the tobacco, there was a large tobacco economy here in Williamson County. Um, and they have, to me, they look very distinct in the pictures because of accommodating crops. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, the, the silhouette of a tobacco barn, if you look at it from the side particularly, is that it is long and then it is tall because of hanging the tobacco in it. You had to have a lot of space. And so uh, they, they were pretty much pole barns in a lot of ways uh, because they had the, the ground or gravel floors. But yeah, you can spot a tobacco barn pretty easily because mm -hmm. of and that. Some of them have ventilation where the mm -hmm. there's actually hin some of the boards are hinged to open up to allow cross ventilation, which mm -hmm. makes the uh, drying much more uh, quick, quicker, I guess you'd say. Yeah, and sometimes they have ventilators at the top. And ventilators at the top. And uh, and that's some of the. Th things that you see on hay barns too is the big ridge ventilators that go along the, the ridge of the roof. How long was tobacco a big 
Uh, well, it was planted rather so early here. It wasn't really uh, um, very, very important until really the 20th century. We had uh, the farmers uh, got together and, and had their own little co-op, which was over at Hard Bargain. Then the Jewell brothers came here, and they were really the ones that uh, were uh, not only raised a lot of tobacco, but they, they served. They had, I think, three warehouses where buyers would come, usually around Thanksgiving, and stay until January or February until the crop crop was sold. Mm -hmm. But it produced millions of dollars for the economy of Williamson County. Almost every farmer at least had some tobacco grown, but then there were others that was their primary uh, income. Uh, and then we've got uh, dairy barns mentioned, which is always dairy barns. I guess it's because of the the rich history and the cows and always fascinated me. Uh, and there's two different types of cows that's mentioned in the book, Jersey and Holstein. And uh, they have a central aisle style. Want to talk about sure. those? Sure. Dairying was so important in uh, Williamson County and in, the, in almost every county for that matter. Uh, farmers, whether small or large, you know, they may have had just one or two cows for their own use of milk and butter. And uh, that was also one of the, uh, the little cash incomes for smaller farms, too, was selling butter and uh, milk. And then we had the, uh, the larger farms and the cooperatives that would buy from the larger dairies. And the barns themselves, uh, the milking parlors that sit next to usually central aisle barns, mm -hmm. uh, you see those still quite a number of those mm -hmm. remain in the county from the days when it was a big dairy producing. But they would bring the, uh, the cows down to the barn and they would mill around until they were brought into the milking parlor and uh, either by hand or then by milking machines, and uh, it, was, it was quite a production. And, of course, it had to be done twice every day. Cows don't like to be. <clears throat> and that industry was, was regulated pretty much by the state. Uh, there was a grade A. Every, everyone wanted the grade A. And uh, yeah. had, those milking parlors were usually uh, concrete blocks, and the floor was, was not dirt but uh, concrete, so it could be uh, washed out. That was a big... A big concern is to be sure that the milk was wholesome and not uh, contaminated in any way, and you almost had to have a concrete building to ensure mm -hmm. that. Uh, a lot of farmers maybe just had one or two cows, and that usually furnished the milk for the family, and that could be done out in the you know under a shade tree to milk the cow, or in a shed of, of the barn. Um, one of the Probably the most important ones were, uh, for, for Williamson County would be stables for the equine uh, farmers. And the climate and the rich soil helped build the equine history here. And um, you want to talk about stables? That's true. Hors <laughs> horses have been here as long as people have. <laughs> And once they outnumbered people, and uh, that was prior to the Civil War. But the stables come in all shapes and all sizes. And uh, the long, low ones that, that house many horses, and then the, the small, compact ones where there may be three or four horses. But, uh, but you still find stables, uh, pretty much newer stables, of course, in, in earlier times, prior to the Civil War, the mules and horses and would have been, been in the, the barns uh, that were built. But today, uh, the newer barns are pretty much all stables that are being built here in Williamson County because uh, Williamson Countyans love their horses. Mm -hmm. um, and also, there's not very many new uses for barns. It's not... Is that correct? Would you say that? 
Well, other than stables being built and, and some people building barns for their machinery, uh, some of the uh, Quonset hut barns, for example, that are being built just to house machinery. There are not any, as far as I know, being built for livestock or crops. These are pretty much the older barns that mm -hmm. are still in use. Well, tell me before we go, uh, how, can, how can someone get a copy of this book if they're interested in getting it? Well, you can come by the Heritage Foundation. There's really not too many left. I think maybe we may not have it, about 30 left. Uh, so they were 20, we sold them for $20. We made them, uh, this was not a money-making uh, operation. Uh, we did this uh, through the Williamson County uh, Historical Society, and we're not a, we're a non-profit, non-profit organization. And uh, this is kind of something just to get uh out to the public of what our culture is and has been in Williamson. And I think that's so exciting because there's so many people here now that are not from Williamson County. And to help them understand Williamson County history, I think is, is very important. And you were very humble at the beginning, but he's Williamson County's Histor <laughs> historian folks. So he knows where all the bodies are buried. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. I've been of that. <laughs> well, thank you both for joining us today. And I thoroughly enjoyed the book. And uh, I would recommend if you want a little bit of further knowledge on Barnes or Williamson County history, get you a copy. And thank you again so very much for being here. And we'll be right back. When I lost my sight, the only thing I had was reading. Whatever your needs are, 99.9% .9 of them can be met by the NLS program. You can choose from large print or braille or audio. It's a free service. It's amazing how much you can get. For information about the Braille and Talking Book Program by the National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped Library of Congress, visit loc.gov slash that all may read. So how was work? It was 1,300 hours. My math class from 302 was in the trenches. Davy Roth had it the worst. Fractions were coming at him left and right. He just didn't get the damn things. Two days ago, I tried to teach him what one-fourth of one-half was using different sizes of blocks. Yesterday, I tried again by dividing up pizza. Both missions failed. Oh, no. But today, I was ready. I created a combat math game where the only way to beat the enemy is to outfraction them. Davy conquered every last denominator. My game was so successful, mm. the principal is deploying it to math squadrons all over the school. Anywho, how was your day? Oh, uh, today my boss treated the office to salad wraps. Hmm, <laughs> salad wraps. No. <laughs> thank you for joining us today. And thank you to my special guest, Rick Warwick, Williamson County historian, and Kanita Skelly Hankins, former MTSU professor, and the the book that we were discussing, Barnes of Williamson County, is available through the Heritage Foundation. It's a beautiful book, and if you would like to learn a little bit more about the history of Williamson County, please grab a copy. And you can also follow us, the Williamson County Public Library, on Facebook and Twitter. Also, go to our website, WCPLTN, Dot org and sign up for our weekly newsletter to find out about all of the programs that we have. And thanks again for joining us. And until next time, explore your world and read. <laughs>